Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with prayer first. And again, in preparation, if you could just open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for uh, your manna that comes from heaven daily, Lord God, that we can eat. And Lord, certainly nourishes us right where we are. And Father, you know what's best, and you know everything in our bodies, and our minds, and our hearts, and our souls that we need tonight. I pray, Father, that as people come by faith to honor and bring glory to you and to obey you, Father, that they would receive all it is that they have for you. That we would lean not on our own strengths, not on our own understandings, but instead on every word that comes from you and everything you provided us for, Lord, for all our contentment. Truly, we want to uh, have the joy of the Lord in everything that's said and done. Take those things that are hindering us from receiving from you. If it's sin, Lord God, we confess it now. We pray, Father, you forgive us and wash us and cleanse us and open up that door, Lord God, that we would be able to receive all it is you have for us. Take away any distractions. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And as we go into Exodus chapter 16, we're seeing it's a powerful chapter, and I'm going to try to plow through it, and I hate that because I really like to take our time and park and, and, and chew and digest those things that God has for us in each of these chapters, but this was a hard chapter to break up without breaking it up into many chapters, and I really do kind of want to get through it. So I've entitled tonight's Bible study, Proving Grounds, and you'll see why as we get started. If you remember, um, last week, uh, Israel had been led out of Egypt, and they had been on high, and then they went to a place where, where they were basically hit a wall, and, and they immediately became murmurers and and they hit a place that they, they had bitterness because they hit water that was bitter that the Lord had to make sweet. And yet the Lord did that exactly for them. And as they waited on the Lord and as, and as they rested in the end of chapter 15 with the promise that Moses said, if you obey God's commands, you will be blessed. That God will continue to provide for you. And he'd already taken them to a place, Elam, where, where he'd given them fresh water. And it was a, a great place of refuge in the middle of a desert, an oasis, if you will. Now they continue on in chapter 16 in their journey, and it says in verse 1 of chapter 16, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which was between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their parting out of the land of Egypt. So this is saying basically they've been traveling for about a month because it tells us in Exodus chapter 14 they left on the 15th of the first month. So this is one month they've been traveling. And now they've hit this place called Sin. In the original text it was actually Zin, Z-I-N, but I think it's very appropriate that it is called the area of Sin because this is a place where in essence the, the Israel starts to be consumed by sin and starts to have this harboring in their hearts against God. And not just against God, but against God's chosen, against God's uh, vessel, against God's words, and against, against God's provision, against God's way. And, and really, they instead of choosing God, they decide to choose the devil. They decide to choose the old way, the flesh. And this can happen to Christians who, who start to lean on their own understanding or start to move in their own strength. Uh, we talked about this last week a little bit. We can grow bitter, and bitterness is the kryptonite to joy, for sure. Every time we walk, we, we look with our eyes, we hear with our ears, we touch with our hands, we want that pleasure that comes to the flesh, that will distract us from those things that are true that the Lord has put before us in the Spirit. And, and, and all of a sudden, darkness will come in where there once was light. In our own thoughts, it starts to overwhelm us. And so this is what happened in here to the congregation as they've hit this land of sin on their way to Sinai. Remember, on their way to this place of worshiping God. I can't, I can't help but think of people who are on their way to church um, or, or even getting prepared for church on a Sunday morning. They're getting ready to come to the house of the Lord and Satan attacks like tremendously. The flesh rears up and sometimes we give Satan credit where it's not credit to Satan. It's our bodies. It's our flesh. We want what we want when we want it, and, and all of a sudden, I'm hungry. I'd rather go eat breakfast, or I want to do this you know, today. Today, it's a gorgeous day, and I, wanna, I don't want to go to the house of the Lord. I don't want to worship God. I want to do this, or I want to do that. And it starts to get in the way, and that's exactly what's happening, is they're on their way to this glorious place of meeting the Lord and to worship God Almighty, who's freed them from a life of, 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 of slavery and abuse and and. and all this wickedness that was put upon them 
instead of instead of being filled with joy and excitement, they start to think about wanting to go back to where they came from. It says in uh, verse 2, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Not murmured against God, but we already know they're murmuring against God. It's, it's God who called Moses to, to go free Israel from Egypt, to pull them out. It's, God, it's Moses and Aaron that God used, Aaron the mouth, and Moses the vessel that God would pour the, the wisdom into and the commandments into to execute, to help lead these two million people out of captivity into fellowship with God. And yet they saw this as, they saw this as men. Again, that, that immediately shows you they were looking in the flesh. They were giving credit to men, which God had done. Moses and Aaron couldn't do anything. They could not have done any of this without God's mighty power. Everything they were doing, they were doing to God. And isn't that exactly what happened with Jesus Christ? As he came, he came to please the Father. He came to do everything the Father, God in heaven, had asked him to do. Even though he was in flesh, he was still God. If you saw Jesus, you saw God. And, and Jesus says that when they come against you, they're coming against me. When they, when, they, when they do good to you or they bless you, they're blessing me. Because you now, us Christians, have died to self and entered into the risen body of Jesus Christ. So again, when we come against a, 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 you know, a vessel of God, we're coming against God. And this, and this is what they're really mad at. They're not mad at Moses. They're not mad at Aaron. They're not upset with them. They're upset with God. And that's the truth of the matter. And it says in verse 3, it says, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the hand of, of the Lord in the land of Egypt. And that Lord that's used there in the scripture verse is the same Lord that's used for God Almighty. They're calling Satan God, in essence. If we die, died at the hand of the Lord in the, in the land of Egypt. They're saying, basically, God, you might as well have killed us with the enemy. You might as well have put us to death just like you did the Egyptians. You might as well have treated us like you did the sinners, those that were puffing themselves up against you. They're talking to God in a haughty, arrogant way. Again, a sign of the flesh, pride coming before fall. It says, and when he had sat by the flesh pots and when he had eaten the bread to the full, and for he had brought us forth out of the wilderness to kill us, the whole congregation of hunger, in hunger. So here we are. Here's, the, here's the, the situation. They're sitting here and they're saying, when we were back in Egypt, the God of Egypt provided for our bellies. He provided bread to keep us full, which wasn't true at all. They were slaves. They'd forgotten the, the horrible life that they were living prior to coming to God, prior to being free. And they'd forgotten the huge party they just had on the mountaintop when they crossed the waters that God had parted. They've forgotten that the Lord had been feeding them with the food, the bounty that, that the enemy had given them to live with and everything. And think of this. They're saying, you've taken us to this place into the wilderness to, <coughs> to, um, to die of hunger. <laughs> Listen, this is, this, is less than a, this is a month later. They're still eating some of the food. They've probably been without food a very short time. I think sometimes the Lord asks us to fast. Because it's in this time of fasting that the body starts to yearn for hunger. We're not starving to death by any means. We're just hungry. These, these men, these, nowhere in the scriptures does it say that animals were starting to die and, and that plants were dying and people had died by the wayside and there were children dying. No, they were just hungry. And isn't that the, the case? Sometimes we can get hangry, right? We're, we're so hungry that we're angry and we get back in the flesh and we start to treat people poorly, we start to come against God Almighty because the flesh wants something. It doesn't have to be hunger for food. It can be hunger for anything. If there's an addiction or there's an idol in our life that we're putting before God, that's the whole purpose of fasting, is to, is to put that to death and to trust in the provision of God. And yet, in this time, you can either turn to God when you're hungry or you can turn back to Satan to provide. And remember the, the heydays. Look at these heydays. And we run back to the bottle. Or we run back to the things that we once worshipped. That are liars and mockers. And seek to kill us. And seek to put us in slavery. Um, so there's, we're going we're gonna to see as we finish this chapter. And, and trust me, I'm going to read a lot faster. Um, as we get near the end, we won't make it through. But I want to hit on some points that you're going to see. Why, why does the Lord allow sin? Why did the Lord allow this place of sin 
for these people? Why does God allow sin in the world? What's going on here? Why did he even allow the sin in the garden? And what you're going to see here is, as we continue in our scripture verses, is the first thing it's going to be to test our obedience. It's going to be to see if we're, if we're for God as we get into verse 4. And 1 Peter chapter uh, 4, verse 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be a reproach for the name of Christ, be happy for you, for the spirit of the glory of God resteth upon you, and there shall be no evil spoken of you, but on your part he is glorified. So again, to glorify. The next thing is to test our faith. The Lord says that he uses sin to try and test our faith. Do we, tr do we put our trust in what God has commanded us to do? Faith is the substance of things not seen, the evidence of things heard. God commands it. Do we walk in it nevertheless? Even when things seem barren, we seem hungry. It seems hopeless. You've only been not eating for a few hours, and we're already saying, I'm not going to eat my next meal. I'm going to die. That's more like a child, isn't it? And yet, the Lord says it's going to make us perfect. In James chapter, this is, this is the second, he, he, he gives us sin. He allows sin in his life. He doesn't give it to us, but he's allowed sin to take place to help make us perfect. James chapter 1, verse 3 um, said, says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect entirely, wanting nothing. So he allows this testing of sin to get you to a place where it can't tempt you any longer. You'll want nothing. Like Paul says, I've learned to be content, whether fed or whether not fed, whether, whether made a base or or made, made high. It doesn't matter. God's not changing. My faith stays constant on the rock. And then um, the, other, the other thing we're going to see later in this chapter is uh, another reason for sin is for God to reveal his faithfulness. That God will provide. That God is the God of, of provision. He's faithful in everything he promises. He's going to get you where he's called you to go. He'll get you to church if you just trust him. <laughs> if you take that step of faith, he's going to get you to church. And then in, into fellowship with him. Ver, uh, the, next, the next thing you're going to see that sin is there for is to reveal the mercies and the graces of God. I don't think if we, if, we, if we didn't fall, if we didn't miss the mark, we would never see that God gives us what we don't deserve, even though we, even though we fail. He also doesn't give us what we deserve. In this case, you know, he's going to provide food even though they deserve punishment. Um, and... and the next thing is to show that God's ways are not our ways. He's going to show miracles through sin. When we see sin happen in the world, we see miracles happen because of that sin to overcome the sin. Things that we cannot do in the flesh to fix and wipe away sin, God does do and has done with outside our knowledge, with outside our intellect, with outside our abilities. God has made a way to cover sin, to wash us and make us white as snow. So miracles come because of sin and, and reveal God. And then to show his glory. As we go through, we'll see that it's the sin, because sin happens, God shows his glory by working, overcoming it. To show the power of God is greater than any of our failures. And then the seventh one is to hear, to show that God hears our cries. While we fall, God picks us up. When we cry out to him, he will reach down and pick us up. Because we sin, God comes if we turn to him and cleans us and forgives us and washes us. But more than that, picks us up on his shoulders and welcomes us wholeheartedly. Here's our cries. And then the final thing, obviously, is there's time when I said in the beginning of this work, sin can cause us to be blind. We don't see God. We look at the world. We look at the things. And, 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 we, and he allows sin. Sometimes we can get very haughty like the Pharisees. And, and even Paul had a thorn in his side, and it's to keep us humble. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 says, So he humbled you, allowing you to hunger, and fed you manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So he says in that first part of that Deuteronomy 8, 3, to humble us. So there's where our, there's many more reasons, but those are the highlights I wanted to bring out before we continue on the chapter of what God uses sin for in our lives. Why does God allow sin? Well, a lot of good reasons. 
Um, it's not that God brings sin, but he certainly will use all things to work together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Even sin, even the temptations of this world. And so as we continue on in verse 4 of Exodus chapter 16, it says, And then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather certain rate every day that I may prove them. There he goes, I'm testing them, I'm trying them whether they will walk in my law or not, whether they will hear my voice or they will continue in the sinful way. So rather than punish them like we would do, he actually blesses them. He, they say that they're hungry, he gives them food. He says in the scripture verses, which one of you fathers out there, when one of their children comes and asks for bread, would give them a stone? How much more shall your father in heaven give you when you have need? Of course he's going to. God is a God who gives us everything we need. He's not going to let us starve to death. And in this case, he's, he's proving his character again. And he also says he's going to use this to try them, to try their faith in him. In verse 5, it says, And it shall come to pass, on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much um, as they gather daily. And we're going to see why he's giving them a special provision on the sixth day. And, and it says, And Moses said to Aaron, And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, at evening you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of God, for that he hath more murmurings against the Lord. And he has heard your murmurings, I'm sorry, against the Lord. And what we are that and what we are we that you are murmuring against us? Who are we that you're murmuring against us? It's God you're murmuring against. He's heard this. But I like, we, we can't skip over 6 and 7 because, because there's some confusion about when quail comes and when manna is fed. And he says that he's going to show them at night the glory that God had brought them out of Egypt. They want meat. They want flesh. And yet this is where the Lord's pulled them out, if you will, into the spirit, which is manna food, which we're going to see is, is, is heavenly food. And yet they still want the flesh. So he says, I'm going to show you that I can give you greater than what this world can offer you. I'll even give you benefits of the world. I'll give you flesh for one night. You will get quail. You'll see later on in Exodus, uh, I'm sorry, um, not Exodus, in um, Numbers chapter 11, that they, that they murmur against God because of manna. And so God gives them quail again. But don't be confused. He doesn't continue to give them quail every night at this point. He just gives it to them once to meet them where they're at. And then he gives them manna every day, which is why when we get to Numbers 11, they complain of this manna. But anyways, I needed to kind of pull that out so there's no confusion later on as we read scriptures. It says that in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 7, uh, 16, in the morning you shall see the glory of God. So this will be the glory as God will do a miracle. This is not something that comes from flesh or work of flesh. It's something God will do. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. This manna will be a bread of God. It comes from heaven. No, There's no food like this on this earth. This is something that God imparts to people that's special. Because he heard your murmurings and we are, and you murmured against us, but he's doing this because you remember to us, he's working on our behalf to show you he's, we're for him. And this is the thing we can rest in is that if you're a minister of God, God's going to work on your behalf. He's going to work things together to help you, to benefit you, to continue to do the work he's called you to do. So that's what he's doing is he's blessing these people on behalf of Moses and on behalf of Aaron, who's the mouth at this point, And he's giving them the food, even though they were murmuring. And he's using them to, to give the good news. And it says in verse 8, Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to be full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which you murmur against him. Again, he's clarifying. This is against God. This isn't against me, the, the pastor. This isn't against me, you know, you're the, the saint or the Christian. No, this is against God. And it says, And we are, and what are we? Who are we? Our, your murmurings are not against us, but, to, but against the Lord, and that word is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah, um, all, the all-existing one, the creator of everything. In verse 9 it says, And Moses spake unto Aaron, and saith unto all, say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness, 
and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. So God manifests himself in a special way. As his word is spoken, it's incredible how the, the darkness dissipates and the light comes in. How the, the, the drunkenness of our thinking, whatever that may come from, whatever it may be, becomes sobriety and we see as though we're supposed to see. When we look, we see God. Instead of looking at the storm, if we look at the word, we'll see God Almighty. That's what God's word does. It reveals God. And so they saw physically a cloud, which you remember, this at the time they'd seen this before, was when they were between a rock and a hard place, when the enemy was coming against them, and the pillar came. It was fire on one side and a pillar before as they were right up against the water, thinking that they were going to die. God revealed himself again at this time. You're not going to die. I've got you, and I'm going to bring you to church. <laughs> I'm going to bring you to a place of fellowship. I, who begun a good work, and you will complete it to the day of your return. And it says in verse 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At evening you shall eat the flesh, in the morning you shall eat and be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. They'll know because this is no other way that this could happen. When we come to church or when we open our Bibles and, and, and we're in a hard place, I can remember, I just talked to a sister in the Lord about this the other day. I can remember when I was a child, I would just open the Bible, I would close my eyes and I would move my finger and I would put it in a place. And no matter where I was in life, the word of God would speak to me. You know, when I was a child, I acted as a child, I knew as a child. And God sometimes meets children in more miracles than he does those that have walked with Christ in a more in a more adult way, if you will. Now we ask this, okay, open your word and read it in its context. Be like a Berean. Study it to know the Lord thy God. And in this in this case, he's meeting them right where they're at, and, and he knows they're kind of children, and he's doing these miracles, and yet it's always to show us that there's something beyond you. Like that child when I was a kid, I saw it, I knew that this word didn't come from man. It was speaking to me at my soul. It was speaking to me to the depths of who I am, my creation, to the marrows of my bone. I knew this was God. Nobody could know this but God, that where I was. And so this is what happened. He said, that I'm allowing this so that they'll reveal the glory of God. They'll seek God. And so it says in verse 13, And it came to pass that in the evening the quails came upon and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay on the ground about the host. And the dew was laid about had gone, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoar frost on the ground, about the size of a pea. You'll, you'll see later, it'll talk about coriander seed. These little, these little things they had to work to pick up. They're little, little pods, if you will. Once the dew had cleared off the ground, these, were, these remained on the ground. And it says in verse 15, And the children of Israel saw it, and they said to one another, It is manna. For they wits not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread of God which he's given you to eat. So they said, What is it? In essence, that's what manna literally means is what is it? And God almost always called it in the Bible, in Nehemiah chapter 9, 15, or in Psalm 78, 24, where it's mentioned, or Psalm 105, 40, where it's mentioned, it's always called the bread of life or the bread of heaven or the food of angels. So as in Psalm 78, 25, it's not called, what is it? <laughs> it's called, it, it, it's heavenly food. It comes from God and it's bread for life. And um, as it continues on, it says, this is the thing, verse 16, that the Lord hath commanded, gather you every man according to his eating an omer, or that's one-tenth of a bushel, if you will, or an ephod, as you're going to learn in the last scripture of the scripture. But it's, it's one-tenth of a bushel, an omer, for every man according to the number of your persons, and take you every man for them which are in the tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more and some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathereth much had none left over. So no matter how much, when they did exactly what God said, they had nothing left over. And he that gathered little had no lacking. God multiplied it even though they had gathered less. God used the food to meet them right where they're at and they were satisfied. Never in this life. We talk about lusting after the flesh. You will get pleasure and the Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season. 
but it becomes what's called insatiable. I need more, I need more, I need more. And yet when we eat God's word, we are satisfied. God satisfies us. He, he completes us. We are at rest. We, are, we aren't yearning. We aren't thirsting. We aren't hungering anymore. We're, we're satisfied. And as we said, each of these people were satisfied. They gathered every man according to his eating. And in verse 19, it says, And Moses said, Let no man leave it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. They didn't listen to the word of God that Moses had given them. But some of them left it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it at every morning, and every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. So as they listened to God and obeyed, the word of God accomplished exactly what it set out to do in their hearts. And they were, they were changing. They were satisfied. And yet the Bible has, says that the word of God is a two-edged sword. If you don't listen to the word of God, it can become death. It can become your execution. It can become a worm, as it says, in outer darkness. Those that, that don't accept the Lord God and their sins are covered will be cast out where there's worms that eat and never, never are satisfied. It's a horrible place, and sin is horrible. You know, when, if, if you take the word of God and, and you use it in its wrong context, you also, it can be used to harm people and hurt people. And in this case, we want to use it properly. We want to teach line upon line, precept upon precept. We don't want to take here a little, you know, we don't want to take a, a piece of scriptures and build a case for ourselves and make it what we want. Or we're, build, or we're making bad seed. We're making bad grain and it, and it brings worms and it's horrible. In verse 22, it says, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread to a two omer for one man. And the rulers of the congregation came to Moses. Okay, here we are entering into the final precept of tonight's Bible study. We're going to go, like I said, a little bit longer, but we're almost done. Uh, this, is, this is very important, because if you remember, what were they doing in the beginning of this chapter? They were thinking about flesh. They were thinking about works of themselves. They were thinking about the work of slavery they were doing and how they said the work of slavery was better than the work of, that they were doing now, starving and being hungry, trusting in God, working for the Lord, entering into his work. Remember, it's him who's doing all this work to liberate them. The Bible says that, that we enter into the works of Jesus Christ. We, we remember that the first works of all creation were done in six days, and the Lord said on the seventh day he rested from his work, and that we were to hallow that day, we were to set that day apart, that it was a resting in God's work, that God is the one that gives us a, 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 a sabbatical, or if you will, a, a work that always accomplishes, and yet a, a never-ending energy when we come to the Lord. If we rest in the Lord, we'll renew our strength, we'll mount up with wings like eagle, we'll run and not grow weary, we'll walk and not faint. If we're exhausted, and we're going to church and we're doing these things, maybe we're doing it in the wrong context. Maybe we're not serving God. Maybe it's not God doing the labor at all. Maybe it's us moving in the flesh, like the Pharisees, in self-righteousness. So what we're seeing here is God's trying to teach them, I will provide for you as you rest in my work, as you do. So he set aside the seventh day, and he's telling them to, to, to get two portions on the sixth day, and the next day, that second portion won't rot. You won't have to do any work that day. You're resting in me. There'll be no going around having to sweep up all these little coriander-type seeds. You can rest. I'm going to give you a time to think about I'm the one who provides. I'm the one who does all the good work. Every good and perfect work comes from the Father of lights who's in heaven. It's not a work of the flesh. It's not a work that's wood hand stubble that we do that's, that gets old and, and, and can mold or can rust or can be eaten by moss. Or it, this is an everlasting work that God's trained to do. And so the Sabbath day is very important to set aside a day when we come together to honor God and his work and to rest, not to, not to do the normal work you will. And today we obviously celebrate the Sabbath as the celebration of the resurrection of the, the work of God on the cross, the work of God over death to accomplish life for everyone. So we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Sundays. We come together in church. We need to set aside those days. It's very important. We're going to see that there's consequences when we don't do this in, in scriptures um, and stiff consequences when we walk in the flesh and not give the rest that God's called us to in him. And so verse 23, we'll continue on. It says, and he said unto them, this is the day which the Lord hath said, tomorrow is the rest 
of the Holy Sabbath of the Lord, that rest which Jesus has become for us, the Sabbath. Bake that which you need, which you will bake today, and see if that you will see it, and that which remaineth overlay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up until the morning, and Moses bade, and it did not sink, stink, neither was it was there any worm there. And so the miracle happened. What they thought, we'd sit there and say, well, I did it this way. It didn't work for me. You know, the word of God, I, I, I really hate when I hear people say, I tried Christianity. It didn't work for me. I'm like, really? It's a way of life. It's obeying God. And the same thing that you think happened one day may not happen a second day. Don't grow weary in well-doing for you will reap in due season if you faint not, the Lord says. Keep going. Keep obeying. And in this case, what happened one day did not happen the second day because they were obeying God. They continued in faith, and they were resting in the Lord. And because they rested in the Lord, that, that, that manna, that what is it, that heavenly angel who did not rot this time. As a matter of fact, it was perfect. This isn't something we could conjure in our brain. Where, well, two plus two is four. If I let it say, it'll stink it the next day. No, it will not. Obey God. Listen to him. And it'll do exactly what God says it will do. In verse 26, it says, The sixth day you shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, it shall uh, there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day to gather, and they found none. So they didn't obey, and there was no word there. Again, they're disobeying God, not following God and His word, and they and like they don't believe. Still, no faith. Still leaning on the work of the flesh. Isn't that how we are sometimes? I love you, Lord. Thank you for providing for me. And then we go out. I got it from here. No, stop that. Keep doing what God says. Enter into rest. In verse 28, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse you to keep the commandments of my laws? See for, see for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So again, God has allowed this sin to prove the hearts of men, to show that they weren't trusting in him. And then obviously he brings the ministers of God. And sometimes you could be a minister of God to help, help somebody with the word of God. Gently coming alongside, seizing your words with grace, and showing them, listen, this is why you failed. This is why you're exhausted. You went out on Sunday when God said, don't do this. God's providing for you this day. God's doing this, so and, and he's given them the word of God to, to remind them again. Sometimes we need it daily, right? To remind ourselves. And it says in verse 30, So the people rested in the seventh day. They finally obeyed what God said. And it says in verse 31, And the house of Israel called the name of the place manna, or what is it? And it was like a coriander seed, white, and it tasted like wafers made with honey. So God gave them something that was very tasty, um, sweet, to the taste, and we know in later places in the scripture it talks about the word of God is like honeycombs on our lips, and, and yet when we eat it, it can become bitterness. We, we learned about that last week, and you can go back and, and listen to that on YouTube if you want. But that bitterness comes to we're resisting God and, and the trials that we have sometimes when we follow God and obey God, there'll be trials. Um, but this is this food from heaven, and it tasted good, and it melted in your mouth um, like MMs. Melts in your mouth, on your hands. Uh, verse 20, verse 32. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill, fill an omer of it. Again, that's one tenth of a bushel. Of it to be kept in your generations. This, that it may see the bread wherein I have fed you in the wilderness and I have brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. This is this is a scripture verse. Again, we're going we're gonna to park it just for a quick second that some people get stuck with. Because if you learn later on the Ark of the Covenant, in the Ark of the Covenant, there were to be three things that were put in the Ark of the Covenant. One of them was a gold jar filled with manna. And that's exactly the command that's being given right here, Moses to Aaron, to create this jar filled with manna for other generations to see this. The other thing was the rod of, uh, of, of Aaron, which, was a, which later would show the rebelliousness of Israel as he put it into the Ark of the Covenant and it budded and actually produced almonds. And, and so that was the second thing that's in the Ark of the Covenant. And then the third thing, which we aren't there yet, but we're going to learn coming up soon, are the Ten Commandments that God gives the heart, the, uh, to Moses, the stone commandments. But you're going to see throughout Scripture, sometimes the, the man is missing and the rod of Aaron. And then other times it's there. And in Hebrews, it mentions all three in the New Testament. 
and yet we know in numbers it mentions that they're out of there. So we don't know why, but there's a couple there's a couple of suggestions of what why that happens. But I wanted to make reference to that for you when you can jump back to this later on, is this when it talks about the manna being stored aside uh, for the Ark of the Covenant for next generations. In verse 33 it says, And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put it put an omer full of manna therein and lay it before the Lord to be kept for generations. That's for the Ark of the Covenant. And it says in verse 34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. He obeyed. And so this is a testimony that God's provision is for us, for all generations. Um, the word of God that comes from heaven, Jesus Christ. Obviously, all of these testify of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 35, And the children of Israel did eat the manna forty years until they came into the land of inhabitants, and they did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. And now an Omar is a tenth part of an ephah, and again an ephah is a, is a bushel. But you saw that, verse 35, we're going to close with this precept, is that the word of God will sustain us until the day of the Lord's return. He who's begun that good work in you will complete everything you need. He will nourish you. He's the same God today as he, as he was yesterday, and he always will be. He's going to use our sin to teach us obedience. He's going to use our sin to teach us and test us of our faith in him, that we'll let it go to him, that we'll not lean on, on our own flesh to cleanse it, but come to the Lord and the work he's done. He'll use it to make us perfect in every way to prove us, to try us, to bring the dross to the surface. He's also going to show us his faithfulness through our sin. He is faithful to forgive us of all our sins if we confess it to him. He will remove it as far as the east is from the west. And so um, he's going to show his mercy and his grace. It says his mercies are new every day. Every day, even though you may have been in the land of sin, turn to the Lord, confess it, and then he will give you mercy. And he will pour his grace upon you. Even when you didn't, they hadn't done it, and he still gave them food when they were crying out of hunger, even crying to Satan to give them what they wanted. And also, he does this to reveal his miracles, and he's going to show miracles to us all throughout. Don't look at sin in the world. Instead, watch how God shows miracles because of sin, and obviously, see the glory of God in everything. As you look to the Word of God, as you come to church, as you fellowship, as you eat the manna of God, you will see God and you will see his glory and it will fill the hearts, the minds, the souls of each and every person and we will be satisfied. God hears your cries. Let's humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift us up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of your word, Lord, your gathering. It's outside of time, Lord, still applies today just as it did then. And the shadows that were, that were revealed then, these people didn't even understand and yet we've been made aware that these testify of Jesus Christ and the working that you've done through him. May we enter into the Sabbath of rest of what God has done for us, what you've done for us. Not walk in the flesh, but walk in the spirit and not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh thereof. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the bounty. Thank you for your provision and thank you for your everlasting love in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.